a second. All right, so howdy, 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 officially, hello. It's great to have everybody here to support and learn all about all sorts of cool anthropology technology from our fabulous Olivia, woohoo! Uh, before we get going, yeah, I know, yay! Uh, before we get going, um, some final details for this week. So yeah, this will be our final sort of in-person week, um, but we will figure things out. And I think um, I will work with I will work with Olivia to get uh, yeah my resident um, online person to get us at least for the next few weeks at least opportunities for us for us to chill and hang out together online. Um, I have a bunch of people, including Larry Crumpler and Jane Abel and um, even Ian, who was just back from Paraguay to talk about his research in Paraguay. Um, so yeah, some webinars to, to sign up. So this one, this week won't be our final week together. Um, tomorrow will be our last in-person day and it will be really unique because it's gonna be a neat mishmash between some botany, yeah, like plants and plants of the bossy, which will be really cool. Um, Josh, our fabulous peer mentor, Josh will be doing a talk um, in person, which will be streamed live um, on backyard astronomy at one o'clock after lunch. So it'll be sort of like a nice hybrid in-person talk and then streamed via Zoom. And then we will have an opportunity to kind of think through doing a nature, doing nature walks and a neat, like a new program, tabling event program. We, did, we, we do all about air, which is for littles and their families. Um, tomorrow, we'll see Wednesday, we have, it's a JD sponsored um, opportunity to go work with the nature center to help them clean up a little bit. It is JD sponsored. Um, either Deb and I will, be, or either Deb and I will be there. So yes, this is a JD sanctioned thing. As is Saturday, um, the Nature and Center invited junior docents to come play with them uh, for their summer events. So we get to offer why we get to offer a nature walk uh, for kiddos at ten. I bet like there's some negotiation now if it's going to be ten or ten thirty, and then we're going to have a table where we get to do our fabulous JD thing. And so I will be there. And so again, a JD sponsor thing. And if you want to come and play and have a good time, enjoy engaging with people, come hang out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and if you have any questions about either of those, feel free to text or uh, email me. And I hate to say it's in, sorry, sorry, but you get to keep your virus to yourself. All right. Um, I got and you. with that- yeah, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure your heart is not broken by not sharing. Um, and again, like, it's my pleasure to welcome Olivia to talk with us about technology and anthropology. So, Olivia, it's all yours. Thanks. Okay, cool. Uh, let me pull up my screen to share. Um, all right. You guys don't, don't look, yeah, okay. So um, today's topic uh, is about the different ways we can use different kinds of technology up, uh, to research in anthropology and to like do conduct investigations um, within the realm of anthropology. Um, and yeah, um, this isn't going to be a super formal lecture. You can um, totally butt in with questions whenever you want, which I'm gonna reiterate probably like six times because I really do want to make sure that people um, feel comfortable shouting questions. Most of you know me. Um, and if you don't know me, I really do love an informal talk. So um, yeah, here's the kind of table of contents of what we're gonna go over today, just because, um, so you know what to look forward to. So first we're gonna define anthropology. Um, after I introduce myself um, and talk a little bit about what I know the most about. Um, then we're gonna talk about this cool thing called LIDAR. Um, and then we're gonna talk about how we can use technology to recover looted antiquities and how we can use technology to preserve antiquities that are vulnerable to being destroyed or looted. Then we're gonna talk about um, virtual autopsies. And then we're gonna have another part 
that's like just Q and A. Um, so questions, you can do them during the talk. If you don't like interrupting, I know I sometimes have trouble doing that um, when someone's talking, just like interrupting with a question. Uh, I will be trying my best to keep an eyeball on the chat. Um, or if you think you have a question, you're like, oh, that might have a really long answer. The Q&A is a great place to put it. Um, yeah. Also, before we start, I want to issue a content warning um, because um, we're going to be talking about some possibly distressing topics. Um, I'm not going to be including graphic pictures or anything like that, but we are going to be discussing things like crime and death and war and um, genocide. So if that's something that um, you think would just be too distressing for you to listen to, um, definitely feel free to head out. I don't judge you at all for it. Or maybe if you're like halfway through and you're like, I thought I was going to be okay with this, but actually, no, this is a little too much for me. You can totally leave. You don't have to tell me. I'm not going to be keeping track. Um, just look out for yourself. Um, no hard feelings at all. Um, yeah. So if you haven't met me before, um, a lot of you guys know who I am, but if some of you don't, um, so my name is Olivia, uh, I'm a senior in high school, and I'm already feeling the senioritis, and I haven't even started yet, so starting strong, um, and I'm a peer mentor, this is my second year, I think, um, and I'm super passionate about um, cultural anthropology specifically, but I, you know, obviously really like all of it, so I'm doing a talk about it, um, and, and history. Uh, there's a couple things I know the most about. Um, so, for example, my uh, specialty is probably um, Soviet and Russian imperial history and anthropology, um, especially Ukraine. Um, my mom's from Ukraine, so I have that personal connection and that personal family history, um, and I've done a lot of research about it. I know that in Albuquerque, maybe this is different for Aiden, who's in California, there aren't that many Ukrainians. I have not met a Ukrainian in Albuquerque who I'm not related to. I've li literally never. Um, so maybe that's the same with you. Uh, maybe you've never met a Ukrainian. Um, maybe you have questions about Ukraine, about Ukrainian culture, or about the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, something I know a lot about. So definitely feel free to ask questions about that um, if, you, uh, if you have any, um, even if you don't think they're related to this talk, although Ukraine will come up um, today. Yeah, so just wanna put that out there. I love answering questions about Ukraine and I love talking about it. So yeah, I also know quite a bit about Crimea, which is this peninsula that's attached to Ukraine um, and Siberia and Alaska and I just, and just, Lots of a lot about the territory that was once under Soviet and Russian control. And I also know a bit about religion within the context of cultural anthropology. Um, yeah, if you need to know some museum trivia about me, my favorite hall is the Triassic Hall. Second favorite is Cretaceous. Uh, this picture is one I took of my favorite fossil in Triassic Hall, which is a phytosaur. Um, I love phytosaurs. I also love ichthyosaurs. If you don't know what those are, they're basically these prehistoric marine reptiles that look like dolphins. They're super rad. And I also really love prehistoric amphibians. Um, so yeah, I'm not a, like dinosaurs aren't my favorite, but if I had to choose one, definitely my favorite dinosaur would be any kind of ankylosaur because they're roly poly. Uh, they're great. They're just fantastic. I don't know, to, <laughs> they're awesome. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna actually get into this the meat and bones of the, the presentation. I wanted to quickly define what anthropology is. Um, and it's basically just the study of humans, which is super broad. And that's why um, it's very common to refer to uh, subcategories within anthropology, some of which you are probably familiar with. Um, so first one that we're, we're gonna actually discuss this one a lot today is biological anthropology. It's also called physical anthropology. Uh, and that's the study of human beings as like a biological, biological entity. Um, and what does that mean? That means like studying how humans have evolved, the anatomy of humans, maybe our close, close relatives like primates, or 
forensics, which is what we're going to be talking a lot about today, um, that falls under biological anthropology. And there's cultural anthropology. It's in the name. It's just about culture. Um, and then there's linguistics, the study of language. And then archaeology, which you've probably heard a lot about. It's, it's probably one of the most popular forms of anthropology in the public. Uh, and that's the study of past humans and past cultures using what they left behind. So maybe there are artifacts, um, their buildings, all sorts of things like that. And then today, we're really going to be talking about applied anthropology. And that's whenever you use any kind of anthropology to solve a real world issue um, or to serve a community. And so um, I really like this diagram that I have on the right um, to really explain the relationship between applied anthropology and just anthropology as a whole. So in this ring, you have all the different cool sub sub fields of anthropology. And then around it is applied anthropology. And I think it's important to say any field of anthropology can be applied. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much all you need to know in background of what anthropology is. Now we're going to be talking about LIDAR. And so I would really like to open it up. We're going to have several opportunities this presentation where you guys get to answer questions and volunteer your opinions about things. And so the first one is I'm going to ask if anyone knows what LIDAR is. If you don't, that's okay. This is kind of a, it's not super talked about, I think. But if anyone does know what it is, feel free to shout it out or put it in the chat. I think it's something similar to like radar. Yeah. It's acronym like radar. That it can is. Be yeah. Oh, I'll say for now. If you want to elaborate, go ahead, but. It's also really mostly all that I know about it. Okay, well, that is a really, really good start. Um, so the first thing before we get into like what LIDAR, how it works, works, we're going to talk about um, what it's replacing. So LIDAR is a way to survey land. And in the good old days, as in the not so good old days before LIDAR, if you had this really big piece of land that you wanted to survey, because you're like, I think, I think there's some really cool archeology span to be done here. You would have to make a map like this with all of these little um, squares, and you would have to physically walk through in those small squares and record everything you saw. A gigantic pain. Okay, like huge pain. Um, and that's not to say that once you that we don't use grids anymore with LIDAR. So let's say you find something. Um, when you dig something up, right, if you have to excavate something, you will still use a grid like this just to keep track of where you found stuff. And so I'm going to ask again, has anyone done an activity like this in school where you had a grid like this? like you made it with string over some dirt and then your teacher hit stuff and you had to record what square you found it in? Um, I don't think I have, but I have seen kids on TV do it. So it looks not that fun. Yeah, anyone else? I've done math problems where that's sort of a thing. You have okay. to find which area in a grid or sort of like battleship where oh cool you sort of like oh yes here's here it is at this degrees and this degrees let's do some some funniness to figure out where all right yeah i think i did this i've done this maybe one or two times and every single time i did it i was bored out of my mind now <laughs> it's super tedious um, and it was my first introduction to archaeology and i was like oh this is really boring um and if that's the case that's all right. Um, it, I mean, it's still necessary. We st it's still used, um, but there is more to archaeology than this, even though this is still part of it. Um, yeah. So now we're going to talk about like what it, lidar actually is. And so lidar stands for light detection and ranging. So it is sounds really similar to the radar name, like. Um, 
then pointed out. So basically how it works exactly like a radar, but with a different wave, pretty much. Uh, so it sends out light. Um, in radar, you send out sound, but it sends out a burst of light at the ground. So usually the, the technology is in an airplane or on a drone. So it goes over the land you want to survey, it sends out some light, and then a sensor will record that light when it bounces back up. And um, it's recording how long it takes for that little piece of light to bounce back up uh, to the sensor. And then a computer is going to take that data and it's going to process it. And it's going to make something called a point cloud. So what the computer is going to do is it's going to pl plot a point representing an elevation. So in this example, uh, someone's done this to measure tree height. So a red point means a high elevation and a blue point means a lower, the lowest elevation. And so the computer will do something like that um, and it will plot a map. Um, and so you can see um, what was surveyed. And this is super, you know, helpful to measure tree height and stuff like that, but it's also really great for archeology. span um, And this is why um, we talk about the Casarabe culture and we don't know all that much about it. Um, and its name is actually not their name for themselves. We don't know what their name for themselves was, but it's the name of a nearby village. So the Casarabe culture is known from sites in Bolivia near the Casarabe village. And um, it's been known for a long time, uh, several decades. And um, a while ago, some archeologists were like, oh, these are some cool mounds. Just kidding, these mounds are the tops of pyramids. But the problem is, is that this location where the culture was is now super forested. And it's also, you know, half buried and all this kind of stuff. So super, super difficult to visualize. And for a very long time, you didn't know what was there um, until super recently, like literally this year, um, some archeologists use LIDAR to generate images of the Casarabe culture um, sites, and they found something super cool. So um, it turns out that uh, the Casarabe culture constructed a low density city. What does that mean? Low density doesn't mean low population. What it means is that it's spread out. And um, you might be saying, oh, what's so special about that? I live in Albuquerque, that's pretty low density. Well, what made this city super special is that between um, you know, these features that they built, so like pyramids and buildings and housing, there would also be farmland, mostly um, probably corn farming in between those um, buildings. And so it was a super like integrated, like you had your agriculture right next to where you were like, like in right next to the city center and stuff like that. So super cool. And also a kind of city that we didn't think could ex like would be existing in the Amazon just because the Amazon is, you know, a difficult place to build cities. Um, but it was, it, it totally existed. It was totally done. Um, now we're going to be talking about recovering looting artifact, looted artifacts and conserving them. Uh, and so I'm going to open it up and ask if anyone can think of any examples of artifacts being looted, um, just any time by anyone in any place, um, just if anyone has any knowledge about it that they'd like to share. Um, I've heard some cases of Egyptian artifacts being looted from areas. That's really good. That is an, that's a really good contribution. Anyone else? When the Spanish went to Mexico, they looted Aztec artifacts, artifacts and melted them down for gold. That would, that's actually super good. That is a really, really, really good one. Um, Yes, 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 yes. The um, Spanish Empire was definitely a looting one, uh, as was, spoiler alert, pretty much every single empire. But yeah, that is a super important piece of Mexican history. Um, but yeah, so those are all really great um, examples. And in fact, Carly kind of predicted one of the examples I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, so 
before we get into it, I have two cases. We're going to talk about looting in Ukraine, and then we're going to be talking about looting in Cambodia. Um, before we get into that, we're going to have to talk about some background information to find a couple of things. So one of the really great ways to recover looted artifacts is financial forensics. And that's basically where you take a bunch of financial data and you analyze it. And um, that way you can prove a crime took place. So if you've ever watched a crime show and the detective has said, follow the money, that's, that's literally what financial forensics is. It's following the money. Um, it's also called forensic accounting. If you ever come across that term, it's the same thing. Um, you can also use it to prove embezzlement and, and fraud and all those things and looting. Um, and then we have to talk about the antiquities trade. And um, this is a huge global network of buyers and sellers. Um, and buyers can be anything from a private collector, very rich person who can afford antiquities, to a museum. And sellers can be, you know, art auction houses and, yes, looters. Um, and so the illegal, illegal antiquities market is worth anywhere from 300 million to 6 billion. Um, and if you're like, wow, that is a super big range, that's not very, you know, why don't we have a more precise number? Well, the thing is, is that as you're gonna see, private collectors make things super hard to actually track down like what has been sold. Like the private and private collectors means very private. So it's actually difficult to know what has been sold. And also um, antiquities are being sold and those are like priceless cultural pieces of heritage. So um, that is a very broad number, um, but it also shows you how widespread it is and how profitable it is. So here's an example. Uh, and Carla mentioned looted Egyptian antiquities and that's exactly what happened at the hands of the Louvre. So you might know of the Louvre as the super um, popular museum in Paris. It's where the Mona Lisa is displayed. And um, it has a location in Dubai also. And that location had looted Egyptian artifacts on display. And the museum director for the Louvre was charged. Um, so even these really respected institutions can profit from looting. Um, and can display looted artifacts and super common. And um, so why are artifacts trafficked or looted? I'm gonna be using those terms pretty much interchangeably. Um, so they can be used to fund regimes. That's what happened in Cambodia, which I'll elaborate about. And it can be used to fund um, war or an armed group, which um, that happened in the case of Russia. That's why looting happens in Ukraine. And it can also be for greed, uh, personal wealth, which was in the case of Douglas Latchford. If you've never heard of him, don't worry, I'm gonna really explain who that guy was um, and why he was pretty horrible. Uh, and then also artifacts can be stolen with the purpose to appropriate culture or to destroy it. Um, yeah. So we're going to begin with discussing looting in Ukraine. Um, the good news is, is that you're going to learn about Ukrainian history. Um, the, the bad news is, is that it is, um, it's, a, it's a pretty broad span of time because I have to give context to a lot. Um, so if you have any questions, definitely, okay, checking this out, okay. Um, okay, I just saw your questions then, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I will get to that at the end. Um, um, all right, what was I gonna say? Okay, good news is lots of history. Bad news is lots of history. So if you get confused or if maybe there's a word you don't know, feel free to ask. Um, totally don't mind. Yeah. Okay, um, and this one isn't super well known, I think, um, among uh, in America, but uh, it was basically a culture that kind of lived in this region. This is super, super broad. We don't know for sure, but this is the approximate region around 5,800 BCE. And I feel like that is so long ago, I cannot conceptualize that. 
Um, it's basically so long ago that writing had not been fully invented in Sumeria yet. So cuneiform was in its like very infantile stages. So that's how long ago it was. Um, you don't have to know super, super too much about um, Kikutani Chupilic culture, um, except that they had really impressive pottery and that pottery is desirable to loot. Um, and then if we fast forward like 6,000 years, pretty much, um, we have the empire of Scythia present in Ukraine around 8 BCE. Um, so Scythia, probably also maybe an empire you haven't heard of, uh, was ruled by the Scythians. Um, and this is a culture that probably originated in Southern Siberia. So like this kind of area. Um, and the Scythians, um, spoke an Iranian language. So um, that language is now extinct, but it's related to um, Farsi or Persian, depending on what you want to call it, and Tajik, but probably its closest living relative that's like the most that you've probably heard of is Pashto, uh, which is spoken in, I think, both Afghanistan and Pakistan today. Um, but they were also a heterogeneous empire. What does that mean? Well, there were lots of cultures in Scythia and among the Scythians themselves, lots of different ways to live. Um, so Scythians were super popular for being really great at horse warfare. And at this time, lots of people were not great at horse warfare. So that's how their empire became so big. Um, but they were also, there were also settlements of Scythians, and that's what makes them significant to Ukrainian history and Ukrainian culture, was that they made their capital in Crimea, which I just circled, that little peninsula, uh, around 3 to 2 BCE. And as a result, the land around Crimea um, in the east and south of Ukraine became saturated with settlements of Scythians. And as a result, they left behind lots of artifacts. And so most of the, the most famous artifacts um, of Ukraine, uh, of Scythia, I mean, were found in Ukraine. Um, and so an example would be this um, diadem. Diadem is another word for like tiara. Uh, so super, super rare, a super incredible find that was found in Melitopol, um, which is a city in Eastern Ukraine. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and so Scythians were also famous for um, other kinds of jewelry. So these plates um, are decorative gold plates that would have been put on a horse um, for, you know, ceremonial decorative purposes, not into battle or anything, so super thin, um, and also swords, uh, swords called akinakas. Um, they were very stubby. You'll see pictures of them in a second. Uh, looked pretty much like long daggers. Um, and a little bit about this time period, um, because we will be talking about Ukraine, I do want to emphasize that the identities of Ukrainians and Russians do not exist yet. We are so far back in the past that that is just not an identity that exists. Um, in fact, the Slavic identity, identity so Slavic is um, a, a language family in Eastern Europe, doesn't exist yet either. It's still, um, the closest thing you have are the Balto Slavs. Um, and what is, that's, means that um, the Slavic uh, language family hasn't um, split from the Baltic language family. If you want some examples of Baltic languages, that be Latvian and Lithuanian. So obviously very, very different to Russian and Ukrainian and Serbian and all of the other Slavic languages. So um, Baltoslav just means they were speaking that predecessor to these um, present day language families. So we're still very far off from the Ukrainian and Russian identities that we're discussing so much today. Um, and so we're going to fast forward a little bit to um, a country called the Kievan Rus. Um, and so maybe you've heard of it called the Kievan Rus. I'm going to use um, the name Kyiv for um, the capital of the Kievan Rus. Um, that's just because um, that's um, what it's called today, because it's today Kyiv is the capital of Ukraine. Uh, and that's the closest, like that's an approximate Ukrainian pronunciation of that city's name. So the capital was in Kyiv, kind of like here-ish. Um, and this is when in 
East Slavic identity becomes a thing. So um, East Slavic is another branch of the Slavic family tree. Um, so East Slavic languages include Ukrainian, Russian, Belarusian, and Rusin, which is very different from Russian. Very similar names, but different. Um, I can't go into it because that's off topic, but if you're interested, ask about it in the Q&A. Um, so this is the last time, pretty much, when Ukrainians and Russians, who don't exist yet, obviously, um, are culturally the same, right? Because there's just an East Slavic culture and it hasn't differentiated. Um, and they, uh, these East Slavic, this East Slavic culture lived alongside some Scandinavian peoples, um, some Baltic peoples, and some Finnish peoples also. Um, what else can I say about the Kievan Rus? Um, for some time, it was actually a um, polytheistic uh, country. So the state religion was Slavic polytheism. Uh, super interesting. Again, kind of off topic, so I can't get into it. But if you are interested, ask about it in the Q&A. Um, and then uh, a prince, Volodymyr the Great, would bring Christianity because he would convert to Christianity. And then that by that way, that's how um, Cyrillic and writing came to this part of Eastern Europe. Anyway, uh, the Kievan Rus is going to fall because of the Mongol Empire. You might have heard of it. Um, and it's going to be under the control of the Golden Horde for some time. And that's when slowly the Ukrainian and Russian identities will develop as separate um, cultures um, alongside Belarusian culture and um, the Rusenian or Rusin culture, which is again, different from Russian, sounds super similar, but different. Um, and I want, I'm, I'm emphasizing this part of history because I think today when we talk about the um, war in Ukraine, we talk about Ukrainians and Russians being brothers, right? Like, oh, why are they doing this? They're brothers pretty much. Um, and that's incorrect. Um, this is this this part in history, this time under the Golden Horde, is pretty much going to be one of the last times that those two cultures are going to consider each other neighbors. Because what's going to happen when the Golden Horde collapses um, is that the Russian Empire is going to begin. And um, the native land of the Russian culture is actually super small um, compared to its modern day boundaries. So it's kind of like this, um, that's like a super broad estimate, but um, the Russian Empire is going to extend all the way out into Eastern Europe, down into the Caucasus, which is this like this area here, then into Central Asia all the way, and then all the way into the Pacific Ocean and Siberia. Um, and that process of conquering land as you can imagine, is super violent. And that's gonna turn the relationship between the Russian culture and the Ukrainian culture from brotherly um, and neighborly to the colonized and the colonizer. And I think that's super important that we establish that that is the modern historical dynamic between the, those two countries. Um, and also I want to touch on Crimea just, just for a little bit because it actually has a super unique cultural history. Um, so Crimea is there. Um, I think we talk about Crimea in the context of Russian ownership or Ukrainian ownership. If you're confused, they're like, what? Don't worry, I'll get to it. Um, but in the 1400s until it was, you guessed it, conquered by Russia, uh, Crimea was home to the Crimean Khanate. And that was, um, like a monarchy that, um, and those monarchs belong to the Crimean Tatar culture, um, which I think I really want to mention because it's just such an important part of Crimean history. So the Crimean Tatar culture, um, they speak a Turkic language. So if you were like Khanate, that sounds familiar. That's because that is a term used by Turkic speaking um, monarchies um, in the past. And they are mostly Sunni Muslim, um, and they are one of the indigenous peoples of Crimea, alongside two other cultural groups, the Krimchaks and the Karaites. Um, all three of those uh, I would love to talk more about. So you know, you know the cue. If you're interested, that's what the Q is for. Um, so they're also still present today, um, although you know 
suffering from persecution and stuff like that, which I'll get into. Well, the Russian Empire will fall and it will be replaced by the USSR. Um, and Lenin, um, because when the Russian Empire collapsed, there was all of those colonies were like free. And they're like, this is great. And then Lenin was like, actually, no. Lenin, who was the first dictator of the USSR, and he re-expanded into those historical boundaries and re-established that like colonized and colonizer dynamic. And that's really gonna continue until Ukrainian independence um, and the independence of all of these other colonized lands. Um, I do wanna emphasize that like that dynamic of colonizer and colonized also applies to pretty much every non-Russian culture in the Soviet Union and the Russian empire. Um, all had to deal with, they all had to do with linguistic and cultural and even religious persecution um, throughout that period, not just Ukrainians. But um, what's going to happen when the USSR collapses is that Moscow, now under a different government, still wants to have that same level of control over those lands that were historically colonized by um, the governments previous. Um, and so that's kind of hard when you have a bunch of independent states, but what's gonna happen is a bunch of countries are going to have um, presidents that are aligned with Russia. And um, that is happened in the case of Ukraine, um, except this president was super corrupt and loved suppressing protests with violence, extreme violence. And that president in Ukraine was um, Yanukovych was his name, but I, I kind of, hate him so I don't say his name um, and um, he was overthrown by protesters by a democratic you know effort and Moscow did not like that which Moscow is the capital of Russia so the Russian government did not like that at all because that means that that influence in Ukraine is lessened and so in retaliation Crimea is annexed it was once part of Ukraine, it's annexed by Russia. And Russia is also going to support rebels in Eastern Ukraine, um, which is going to displace a bunch of Ukrainians and lead to a bunch of civilian deaths. And that's how the war in Ukraine begins. In 2014, when that president is overthrown and Russia retaliates. Um, and I wanna emphasize that because I hear a lot that the war began this year and it's not exactly true. Um, the invasion of Kyiv and all of the rest of um, Ukraine pretty much did start in 2022, but um, there was, there's been a uh, Russian military presence in Ukraine for much longer than that. Um, and it's just been simmering for many years until now. Uh, and as a result of the current war, um, Russia has, occupied a lot of Ukraine, including uh, places that have museums with valuable Scythian artifacts, including this diadem. So this diadem was found in Melitopol, which is a city in eastern Ukraine that is occupied. I think it still is. Um, and this diadem, along with 198 other Scythian artifacts, were taken by Russian soldiers. And I believe at least some of them are in Russia now. Um, so the, I think it's unlikely that that artifact will be recovered. But what about other artifacts that, you know, have been looted? Uh, and the good news is, is that some of them have been recovered. Um, but I will just pause for a second and ask if anyone has any questions, because I know that was a lot. And it makes sense to me because I've been, you know, reading about it for so long and like babbling about it for so long. I know and I just want to make sure that if anyone has any questions, I get to them. Um, nope. Okay. Uh, again, I'm keeping an eyeball on the chat. So if you have anything, feel free. Um, so there was a super recent case, like I mean, maybe a month or two ago, in which some Ukrainian law enforcement were tracking down this group that was sending money to Russia and the DPR. If you don't know what the DPR is, it's, that's the Donetsk People's Republic. And that is a rebel group in Eastern Ukraine that has been sponsored by Russia. Um, so they're aligned with Russia. Um, and in the process of following the money using financial forensics to track down like this funding of um, 
the Russian military, they found 6,000 looted artifacts, um, which is a lot. And among them are some pottery from the Kukuteni Trapilia culture. So that's in this picture right here. And some Scythian swords, Akinakos. Remember, I mentioned those stubby swords. So in this picture, we have a lot of swords from a bunch of different eras. I am not a weapons expert at all, but um, if you would like to see some Akinaka examples, here's one. Again, super stubby, stubby little guys. Here's another one, another one, another one, another one. So if you look out in this picture for stubbier swords of that approximate design, um, that's what those are, Scythian swords that have been recovered. Um, and in another case, um, in the UK, there was someone who was trying to smuggle in small artifacts. And these were probably not, um, these were probably just regular Ukrainian citizens who were metal detecting and wanted to make money at the expense of cultural heritage, of course, which is horrible, but not, they, this wasn't connected to war probably. But anyway, the UK border forces, they were like, why do you have a suitcase full of artifacts? That's not legal. That's antiquities trafficking. And the plan was, I believe, that they wanted to sell these artifacts as Viking artifacts, because that's something that's recognizable to um, a Western consumer. Like, we know what Vikings are. Even Aiden mentioned Vikings just a little bit ago. Um, so to sell that as a Viking artifact to make money. But I want to emphasize that that is super rare. Usually what will happen is you, if you're going to recover an artifact, at least in the context of Ukraine, it's going to be through financial forensics and following the money um, in connection with other criminal um, um, endeavors, like sending money to rebels and um, invading militaries. So yeah. Um, uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Don't let me steamroll over you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so how do people know where to find artifacts like this? Do they just go where there might have been like a recent story on a discovery and just loot from there? Yeah, or So, I mean, you can, the thing is, is that there's a lot of artifacts out there. We just, they're just buried. So if this is a super popular hobby, even in the US, like metal detecting. Usually it's not for artifacts. It's probably stuff for like, like really modern stuff. Like if people have lost jewelry or phones or something, people will take out their metal detector on a beach or something. Um, and so I guess if someone has knowledge of, hey, this is a place where there's like, this is an archeological site that isn't very well guarded or protected, that's a way you can, you know, scrounge up some coins or something like that. Or you can just um, go to a high traffic area um, or you can walk through someone's field, you know, stuff like that. There's just like the opportunities are pretty much endless um, for those people. All you need is a metal detector and some luck pretty much. It's, it's not a super um, high skill kind of endeavor. Um, I'm sure there are some um, of looters who have that kind of knowledge, but um, I hope that answers your question. Um, it does, yeah, thank you. All right, so as a result of this war um, in which Russia has invaded Ukraine, um, a lot of artifacts are at risk, right? You have lots of regular bombing of not just military um, installations, but also civilian installation cities, which obviously have their own archeological histories, their own cultural artifacts, um, some of which are quite big, like churches and things like that. Um, also lots of big museums in cities that have priceless artifacts. And so how do you preserve those vulnerable artifacts? Well, in Ukraine, it's done a number of ways. And so the most like a common one is just moving the artifacts. Sometimes that is successful. I know a lot of big museums in Kiev, um, Kiev, yep, proper pronunciation, um, have been using, um, have, have successfully moved their artifacts to secure locations. Um, sometimes that's not super successful. Like I believe in Melitopol, they tried to hide the, the Scythian gold um, and that eventually was looted anyway. Um, sometimes you can have staff of a museum if they're in a, an occupied area. So in the east, 
of Ukraine. Um, sometimes there have been times when they've been literally held at gunpoint to by soldiers to tell them where those artifacts are. Um, so there are other ways that people have been preserving artifacts digitally to ensure that you know, if something gets looted or destroyed, it's not completely lost. And so there's a couple ways that this has been done. Uh, there's this one, the first one that I'm gonna talk about is SUCHO. So that's an acronym that means Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online. And so basically what it's gonna do is that it's backing up the archives and databases of state archives, um, so basically the Ukrainian version of the Library of Congress. Um, lots of cities have their own government archives um, that they'll, those will have historical documents, stuff like that. And also museums will um, have databases. Ours has a database, for example, our Natural History Museum of fossils, right? And so plenty of Ukrainian cultural museums have their own databases of stuff they have often with pictures. And so those are being backed up online. And so why do you need to back up something that's online? Well, online databases rely on physical servers with physical equipment that can be vulnerable to being shelled or bombed um, and otherwise destroyed in the process of you know, invasion. And so it's important to back that, that thing up by, by a second party. And that's what's been done. Um, that I know that that project is eventually trying to make it something that the public can access, but um, right now it's just a bunch of raw data. Um, so it's being processed. Um, so uh, maybe I'll send out an email whenever I see that they've entered that new phase of like public participation, if you wanna take a look. But it's super important because, um, here's an example. So in Kharkiv, uh, which is a big city in Ukraine, um, kind of in the northeast of the country, kind of, um, there was a government archive with lots of rare documents and stuff like that, um, that had an online server, but went for, went, <laughs> sorry, but that server went down four hours after um, that the Sucho project backed it up um, from bombing. So obviously something that's super important um, because let's say that um, online archive, it went down. What if the physical archive became damaged um, and then you would have lost all of those, you know, priceless documents forever. Um, and another one, which is super interactive and super cool, um, that I will send a link to. Um, I have a bunch of links that will probably be sent out after this, um, is called the Backup Ukraine Project. So it's basically this platform that has been created by UNESCO and this um, 3D imaging um, program that allows people in Ukraine to submit 3D scans of cultural heritage. And so that can be statues and buildings, and it can also just be like normal everyday stuff. Um, and so you can access those. Here are some of my favorites. Um, this one is a wooden church. Um, wooden churches are super flammable. Um, so they're super vulnerable to being bombed, and it's happened quite a few times in Ukraine already. So. Someone's 3D scanned a um, wooden church in Kyiv. Um, this is a like statue bust thing that is probably on the side of some building of um, his, his name is Mikola Makarenko um, and he was an archeologist. I thought, yeah, I'll include him because he's on theme. Um, and then this one is another um, like thing that would be on a building. Um, this is a, a um, representation of Les, Lesia Ukrainka. Uh, she was super cool because she was a writer in Ukraine during um, Russian imperial rule and um, the Russian empire for some time banned the Ukrainian language and like you couldn't teach it, you couldn't um, print it or write it, anything like that. And she sent her Ukrainian writing over just like just over the border to have it published in her native language. She thought she's super cool. She's kind of like one of my role models. She's super cool um, historical figure. And I actually think this is on the side of a printing house of some kind, like a printing press building. Yeah. Um, and then this one is a statue um, also in Kyiv. Um, and that's, um, it's of 
this statue is probably one of the first statues I ever learned about in Ukraine, really. Um, so it's a statue commemorating the victims of the Holodomor. Um, you might know it as the Holodomor, um, but that's a more a, like English way of saying it. Um, and that was a famine that took place in Ukraine. It was an artificial famine, so constructed by Stalin. So Stalin purposefully starved um, people in Ukraine and it killed like five to seven million people. Um, so a super fa fatal like event um, and a super important part of Ukrainian history. And so this is a monument that's for those victims and specifically the children who um, died in that famine. And I think to just show how important this statue is, I was looking through this backup Ukraine like website, just looking through all of them, finding cool ones I could put up if there was presentation. And this statue was scanned, I think probably six times from what I saw. Um, so just like something that people really wanted to preserve. Um, and yeah, um, I'm gonna start talking about um, Cambodia. If anyone has any other questions, maybe about um, Ukraine, of course, that's what the Q and A is for. But I want to open it up just in case someone has like a burning question that they need to ask right now before we continue. Okay. Um, it, oh yeah, then you go ahead. Is it Kiev or Kiev? Because okay. I've heard, I've heard people who are from Ukraine and they usually say Kiev. Okay, so that's actually a super loaded question, um, and I'm going to answer it briefly, but. I will get back to the end of the Q&A because it, it can go into a lot of different ways. But Kiev is the Russian pronunciation. Um, let me actually, I can spell it out for you. Um, so, so, so for some people who like grew up in Russia or grew up in Ukraine when it was part of the Soviet Union and learned uh, Russian as, the, as their language, maybe they might say it's still Kiev. Yeah, so, um, and Kiev is a super popular way of saying it in the West. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's a really common way to say it. If you want to say it closer to how it's said in Ukrainian, I still have a lot of problems with this. I'm not the best at pronouncing Ukrainian. So this is the Russian. Um, this basically is Ki. This is Ye. So that's the important letter in this. And then this is the letter for V. Um, yeah, Cyrillic is like that. In Ukrainian Cyrillic, you know, that's the one, that's, it's like this. So we still have the key, but we have this letter, which is like an I with two dots. And that letter makes the U sound. So it's like two E's. That's like the, the equivalent of English. So it's key U. Um, it's like really long U that makes it a Ukrainian pronunciation. And that's sometimes hard to say when you're speaking really fast, like I do when I babble pretty much, but that's both are correct technically, but it is preferred to say, I at least prefer to say Kyiv um, and to spell Kyiv like, like this. So sometimes you'll see the capital spelled like this. That's the Russian spelling. That's the Russian romanization of the Russian Cyrillic. <laughs> That's super confusing, sorry. But um, yeah, to answer your question. Um, but I would love to talk about the role of the Russian language in contemporary Ukraine because it's super interesting, um, but can't get into it now because I'm already going over time and we're not even halfway through. I knew okay. this was gonna happen. <laughs> I'm gonna try and be right. brief. I don't wanna hold people for like too long. Um, but that's an excellent question, Zen. Thank you for bringing it up. It's my favorite topic to talk about. Um, all right. So now we're going to be talking about Cambodian sculpture. And so um, Cambodian sculptures are one of the sculptures, like one of the artifacts that are looted the most. Um, and so I want to talk about the significance of Cambodian sculptures before we talk about um, how they've been looted. And so a statue um, in Cambodia, it's not just a physical like representation of a deity or a king, but it is also um, a place that holds the soul of, of 
and, and this varies among people. They, there's lots of different beliefs about this, but maybe it's the soul of a deity, a soul of a king, or even the souls of like the collective like ancestors of people of Cambodia. And so when you damage a statue or take it out of Cambodia, it to it's akin to killing the soul inside or you know damaging the soul inside or hurting it in some way so it's when a statue is looted from cambodia um it's not just a loss of culture it's also a you know it's also like essentially assaulting the soul inside so it's a very serious um loss um when those sculptures are looted um and one of the ways, and we're going to talk about this a lot, that you can tell that a statue has been looted, and this is a general rule, not just for Cambodian sculpture, is that the legs will just be missing, like, or the feet. And this is because, and also the arms are also taken off quite a lot. Um, and this is because um, these statues, obviously very important, they're put on pedestals of solid stone. And so to take that sculpture off to loot it to traffic it to a different country they are typically just cut off of the pedestal um and now the statue has no feet or legs um and so now we're going to talk about um wait before that i'll explain this picture um this is a sculpture that is currently in the metropolitan museum of art in new york city and this is called the Harihara statue. Um, the term Harihara can mean a lot of different things, but in this um, context, it is a um, sculpture in which it is representing, half of it is representing the Hindu god Shiva, and the under, other half is representing the Hindu god um, Vishnu. So very important deities, but they're both represented in one statue. And this was a sculpture that was put it was added to the met, met i'm going to say met the metropolitan museum of art um collection in the 70s and so and this is a sculpture that's thought to be looted so how did why is the 70s important to understanding looting well in cambodia during the 1970s um there was a regime um called the khmer rouge in power and and this was it, represented by the dictator Pol Pot. Um, so the Khmer Rouge was a very, 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 very horrible and genocidal regime. So they were responsible for the Cambodian genocide, which killed two million people. Um, and to fund the regime, the Khmer Rouge um, would loot ancient cities in Cambodia. Um, and so they would loot the cities, ancient cities of Cambodia and sell the statues to get money to continue the regime. And that is how a bunch of statues made their way into the West, um, because looters um, would take advantage of the Khmer Rouge, of the you know ongoing like the genocide and the suffering in Cambodia to make money and to traffic those artifacts into um, different countries around the world. And so one of the people who is really like one of the main people responsible for a lot of the looting um, that would bring sculptures into American and British museums was this man called Douglas Latchford. Um, and I'm telling you his name because um, he is a horrible person and you kind of don't want to promote horrible people, but he did write a fair bit about Cambodian artifacts. So if you ever come across that name, um, that's who that is. That is not a like scholar or anyone respected. That is a looter. And Lots of, if you ever go to a big museum with lots of artifacts, some museums will still have placards that say gifted by Douglas Latchford. So I think knowing that name is a little, it's pretty important. So who is Douglas Latchford? He was this guy who was, who was for some time pretty respected in the museum, like antiquities community, but who was really looting and selling Cambodian artifacts beginning in the 70s. So beginning when the Khmer Rouge was in power and doing all of these horrible things in Cambodia into the 2010s when he was, until he was finally caught in 2011. And so here's how he was caught. Um, this is a statue, this statue um, was being sold by a private, like an art house um, to a private seller. 
and um, it was marketed as like an athlete. So like as a generic, like just Cambodian, like statue, like it's just of a, a really athletic person. Um, and there was actually an archeologist who was super familiar with Cambodian um, artifacts um, who re recognized this sculpture is actually being a representation of this protagonist in um, a really popular Hindu epic um, that was missing from the Ko Kur temple in Cambodia. And that's what started this huge federal investigation. So using financial forensics and all these financial analysis um, investigative methods, um, the federal investigation determined that Latchford had been looting for literally decades. And they had to use a lot of financial um, forensics because Latchford and the Latchford family had offshore trusts. So a trust is basically like, like that a trust holds all of the family's assets, like their land and their valuables. And in this case, a bunch of artifacts. And offshore means that they've put that, they've made that trust in a country outside of America because he was living in America for a very long time. So they had their trusts in Jersey, which is this island between England and France that is super notorious for being like super, 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 super secretive about any bank accounts or trusts that are made there. Um, so you had to, they had to lose, use a lot, a lot of financial forensics to determine um, that looting had occurred. Well, He's looted hundreds of artifacts. So where are they now? Some of them are in private collections. Um, so he himself had something like 125 artifacts at the time he died. He died before he was actually able to be tried for looting and antiquities trafficking. Um, and his daughter has promised to repatriate those artifacts. I don't think it's happened yet. I don't know if it will, but she's promised that. I don't know how much it's worth, you know? But, um, and so also just, rich people have huge private collections. An example is George Lindman, who I believe passed away, but he at some point, like many rich people do, put his mansion in Architectural Digest, which is like this magazine, all about architecture as it has is in the name. And in those pictures, um, archeologists were able to determine that he had six Cambodian artifacts in his home. And not just like any artifact from Cambodia, like artifacts of utmost cultural importance like so important that like they had um like in the Cambo like the national um national museum of cambodia i believe um they have a pedestal on display waiting for one of those artifacts that was in lindman's home so that's how important those are um and very significant is that lots of museums still have looted artifacts associated with Latchford, known to be connected with Latchford, still have them on display and still are not repatriating them, which means like putting, giving them back to Cambodia, even though they've been asked by the Cambodian government, by Cambodian museums to repatriate them. And so I'm gonna talk about the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, because it has the most um, pieces linked to Latchford. Um, this table is from a Washington Post article. Um, I have, a, there's a link and a PDF in case of paywall issues that we can send out after this um, that you can check out on your own. Super important and interesting article. So um, I was looking at the Hariara statue. So that's the half Vishnu, half Shiva statue I was talking about before. Um, and I was looking on the Met website because they have a website showing all the stuff they have on display. And so here's its page. Um, and I want to emphasize just like, this is how non-transparent all of these museums are. Sometimes they will say that Latchford gave it to them, but I think because of Latchford's, um, you know, charges that's kind of changed. So here, if we look at the credit line, which is basically, um, that just tells you the information of how the um, uh, artifact was bought or if it was gifted, something like that. So they say anonymous gift, um, which is not true, um, but because it was from a private collection, you know, because it was bought by private buyers, that privacy means that they can be as untransparent as they want. So, and then if you see here in the provenance, provenance just means origin. Um, you have very little details, nothing about the sculpture being looted, only that is from this um, auction house, which is actually one that um, Latchford really liked to sell artifacts through. And that's, that's it. 
no acknowledgement of looting at all. So this is something that maybe is not super transparent by museums, but is still something that is like super prevalent in the museum world. Um, and then I was just randomly scrolling down on this page for the Harihara statue. And it, the computer program that runs this database suggested some artifacts on display from Cambodia. And I could not believe it because every single one of these statues has no legs and all of them don't have arms either. So, and that's like a dead giveaway that they've been looted. Some of them are got, were added to the collection um, after the seventies or during the seventies um, and others were added before in the 1930s. So all that means is that like, they weren't looted by Latchford, but they were probably looted by somebody. And so, and I think it's so crazy because growing up, like imagining artifacts, like I did imagine them damaged um, because it was, it's so prevalent. Looted artifacts that are damaged in the process of looting are so prevalent in the public sphere that that becomes like, we think that's normal. And that's not normal at all. That is like, looting, loot, evidence of looting. Um, so if you're interested um, to look at some artifacts online from a institution that doesn't profit off of looting, then I have some for you. Um, links will be sent. Um, the first one is the National Museum of Cambodia. They have an excellent English language website where you can look at detailed descriptions of artifacts. You can look at art history of Cambodia, super great. This is a picture from their website. Um, and if you notice, this is so great. The provenance isn't some art house or shady like private collector. It's actually a province in Cambodia. And that's uh, authenticity and legality is so great to see on a website. I'll tell you after all this research I've done. And they provide a lot of explanation. So um, as you can see, like a, lots of info about this particular artifact. Definitely recommend it. Then you, I also have a link for the ICOM list for Cambodia. So an ICOM red list is a list that is given to law enforcement and you know museums and stuff to tell them these are artifacts that are vulnerable to being trafficked. So keep an eye out for them. Um, and so that doesn't mean that those artifacts have been stolen, but it does mean that they've been like they're vulnerable. Um, maybe they're in a in a country that is um, experiencing war or maybe has experienced war. So there's like an influx of looted artifacts, all, all that. So just anything that's vulnerable is gonna be on that list. Um, and they also have lists for other countries like Syria, Iraq, a um, bunch of countries in um, like, and like Nigeria and Africa. So I definitely recommend you check that out. Super informational, um, yeah. Okay, so this is the last section. Thank you so much for sticking through it and asking questions. Um, I will I will let people like give a little pause to let people ask some questions if you have any. Um, yeah. If not, that's cool. Um, so with the artifacts, is the reason why they're damaged like how people loot them or? Yeah, so um, there's pretty much like two ways a looted sculpture in particular can get damaged. So the first one is that the sculptures are pretty much always on these super bulky pedestals. Um, and those are super hard to move because they're like gigantic slabs of stone um, because the people wanted to display these statues because they're so important. Um, and so looters will just cut off the feet because that's like the thinnest part of the sculpture is like the ankle um, or like the spot above the ankle um, to just be able to remove it. Um, and also looters would commonly just chop up sculptures. Like they'll just chop them up and send them to people. There are quite a few artifacts that like came to museums in pieces and for some like, and the museums just turned a blind eye because they wanted this cool sculpture on display. So if you see a sculpture that is like missing like arms, legs, it looks like it's been stuck back together. That is a sculpture that has been looted. Um, yeah. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah, cool. Uh, I also know Zen had his hand up. So if you wanna go ahead, Zen. Hey, so um, 
I actually do know some people in Albuquerque who are from Ukraine. Woo, and, cool. Yeah, but um, one person I know who is uh, Ukrainian is actually moving back very close to Ukraine now. Oh, wow. Out with uh, sort of the things surrounding the war. So it's uh, uh, providing support, people who are fleeing from Ukraine, things like that. So just sort of, it, it's in Ukraine, but like right on the border with Poland. Yeah. So the West, yeah. But, and he's, he's uh, yeah, he's super cool. And uh, the thing is that uh, I feel like Ukraine has been uh, in contention for years throughout uh, history. Yeah. Things like geographically that make it super significant. What are some, some yeah. the main reasons that it's been pushed and pulled in all these different directions? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of reasons. So geographically, Ukraine is, um, it's on the Black Sea, which is attached to the Mediterranean Sea. You kind of have to like maneuver a little bit, but it's on the Mediterranean Sea pretty much and the Black Sea. And that's, you know, from the Black Sea, you can trade with Turkey, you can trade with Greece, um, you can trade with Russia, that kind of thing. Um, and it's also between the Eastern and Western Europe. I mean, it's still like, in Eastern Europe, pretty it's pretty nestled in there, but its position is west of Russia. And that makes it one of the defenses Russia uses for invading is that they don't want NATO to be present in Ukraine because it would be close to Russia. So because Ukraine's kind of in this like this um you know middle area where you're where you're getting like between Russia and the rest of Europe that is part of the European Union it's, it, it can tip the scales of who has power in that region. So Ukraine really wants to become a part of the European Union and NATO. If it did, Russia would feel threatened. That's because they want power over Ukraine. They want as much power over, you know, Eastern Europe as possible. Um, so it's in this inconvenient spot for its independence because it is between us those two modern powers, Russia and the EU. Historically, it was also split between the Russian Empire and um, uh, the, Lithuan the Lithuanian Commonwealth. So that was like Poland and Lithuania were like teamed up and they were like their own country. And also um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was like also on the border too. So it was at like the nexus or like the intersection of a bunch of competing world powers, and it has been for a very long time. Um, something that also makes Ukraine super valuable is that it has really, really, really excellent farmland. So um, for example, my mom is from central Ukraine, which is known for its black earth. So black earth is just a very, very fertile kind of soil. Um, it's really great for growing things like wheat. Um, so and it, it, the farmland there is super productive. Um, and for a long time, Ukraine was referred to as Europe's breadbasket or the Soviet Union's breadbasket because it produces so much wheat um, because that soil is so fertile. Um, and it also has, you know, along with the Black Sea, it has the Dnipro River, which is this huge river, um, which is really convenient for getting around. Um, so all of these things really do contribute to being like invadable pretty much. Um, yeah, it's a good question. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about some virtual autopsies um, and then we're gonna end the presentation. Um, so I'm gonna ask if anyone can think of what a virtual autopsy might consist of. Um, yeah, I'm gonna open that up if anyone has any ideas. What is a virtual autopsy and what is an autopsy period? Why is an autopsy important? Yeah, um, I think, uh, well, an autopsy is important for really looking into something and really studying something. And, and really taking it apart and looking at all the components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I imagine it'll be something that contains some of that, really taking something apart and trying to look at it and really understand how it works and what it does. All right, so you're on to it. So 
what exactly are we examining, I guess, with an autopsy? Because there's like, in, I'll give you a hint. So it has to do with forensics. So like, how is an autopsy going to help? And like, what, why is it like in that way important? Because in forensics, if anyone has any ideas. I know you often hear about it in crime shows, like the forensic analysis team. I think it, uh, it's sometimes if there's like a dead body or something, they will go in and try and evaluate the situation. Yep, that's a, that's the, that is the main goal of an autopsy by like a forensic anthropologist or a medical examiner is to determine time of death, um, the cause of death, um, and maybe what may happened before that person died. Um, and so we're going to talk about a virtual autopsy um, and basically how that can, how can we, what different technologies can we use in an autopsy? Um, so virtual autopsies are also called vertopsies. It's a kind of cheesy name where you just, it's just the creator of that name just smushed together virtual and autopsy, vertopsy. And so that's going to use non-invasive methods to determine cause of death and to determine, you know, maybe what happened before death to help identify someone um, and things like that. So um, there's a lot of different technologies you can use in a virtual autopsy. So I'm going to talk about a couple, PMCTs and PMMRIs. So the PM, these are just regular CTs and MRIs, but the PM means post-mortem. Does anyone know what post-mortem means? Do we have any English language nerds in the Zoom today? Okay, uh, Zen, do you want to, I saw your hand, you got excited. Well, if no one else is going to say it, I will say it. Anyone? Okay. In post-mortem um, after death. Or, no, or is before. Yeah, it's before. No, no it's po after. you're right. Yeah, it's after. So um, post-mortem is after death. Um, so we're doing a CT and an MRI after a person has died. Um, and perimortem is, I think, what you're looking at. So that's right before death or near death. Um, so we will use CTs and MRIs, and that will give you an image of the person's body. And then you can also use something called an MRS. So it that's this it uses the same kind of technology as an MRI, um, which is magnetic resonance, so like using magnets. But that, that's not going to give you an image. It's going to give you a graph. Oh, there's something in the chat. Okay, bye, Suzanne. Thanks for coming. Um, um, and um, it'll give you an, a graph that will tell you what chemicals are in the place you scan. So in this example, um, someone has scanned a brain and they're looking at the chemicals in the brain. And that can be valuable because um, lots of different health conditions can um, result in different chemicals being present at higher levels or lower levels in the body. Um, you can also use postmortem biopsies. So a biopsy is when you sample tissue. So, um, you know, people when they're, you know, alive will go to a doctor for a biopsy. So um, to maybe check if something is a tumor or um, cancerous. And so you can do the same in a virtual autopsy um, to take a little sample um, to determine if someone had a disease that caused their death. I um, mean, you can also take 3D scans of the body to um, as another supplementary form of data. Um, and so why is this advantageous? Because it is super non-invasive, right? You're not doing a lot of cutting. Maybe you take a biopsy, um, which is maybe sometimes that might require a little incision, but nothing like a standard autopsy, which requires a lot of incisions, um, which can, you know, um, sometimes some people's personal or religious beliefs can, um, forbid um, doing largely invasive procedures on a dead body. And so by having it be non-invasive, you're honoring that person or their family's belief, um, beliefs. 
And it can also be really private. So in this picture, this is kind of inaccurate because they have a mannequin um, representing, you know, a body that would be going into um, have a CT or an MRI. But really, a person's body would be in two um, bags to cover them. So it's super, super private compared to a standard autopsy, um, in which at some points of the standard autopsy, uh, some parts of the body might be covered, but um, not all the time, you know, not everything um, because they have to do the autopsy. Um, and you can also store that data for later use. So let's say if it was, this was a murder investigation and something after that person was buried was discovered, so a new piece of evidence, instead of a unnecessarily needing to exhume or unbury that person, um, which can violate some people's beliefs, you can just pull up that data and review it. Um, and that can also honor someone's beliefs. Uh, it's also easy to share data. Um, it's also very much, it's much more hygienic than a standard autopsy. Like in standard autopsies, definitely ways to be hygienic, but it, it, it necessitates lots of different procedures. Um, whereas in a virtual autopsy, you don't need as many to be hygienic. Um, and it's also very accurate. So it has an 88% accuracy rate compared to a standard invasive autopsy, which is a 93% accuracy rate. And so maybe you're wondering, where does that 5% difference come from? So um, virtual autopsies kind of have a little bit of difficulty identifying things like blood clots, which can indicate cause of death or a condition um, like a, a perimortem before death condition. And also um, because you're using machines, a forensic anthropologist and a medical examiner can't use senses like touch to determine um, cause of death. And some people, although there's not a lot of data to support this, like no like statistics, um, some experts believe that like telling if someone died from an infectious disease is harder to do with a virtual autopsy. It's also something that requires training and the equipment itself is expensive. Um, CTs and MRI machines are very expensive. Um, so how can you apply virtual autopsies? And there are many ways to do this. And one of them is in archeology. span So mummies are very, very delicate. Doing a standard autopsy on a mummy is like, that just can't happen because mummies are so fragile. Um, you just can't. So if you, they did a virtual autopsy on King Tutankhamun or King Tut, who was famous for being like the boy king, like we're the boy pharaoh. Maybe you've heard of him that way. And historians used to think that he died in war, but he probably actually died, according to this virtual autopsy, from malaria. And probably on the long side, he had a broken leg. So that probably got infected. So malaria and a bone infection. And they also determined that he had many diseases that made it very difficult for him to walk on his own. So he had a club foot. He had Kohler's disease, which is a rare genetic bone disease. He had oligodactyly, which is when you are um, you don't have um, five digits on your hands and, and your feet. Um, and he also had bone necrosis. So all of these made it very difficult for him to stand on his own. And that explains why in his tomb, he had so many walking sticks because they were given to him in his tomb so he could have them in the afterlife. Um, so he had over a hundred walking sticks. And one of them is this picture, um, let me bring up the little pointer, I lost it. But um, so this one he actually made, it's made out of bamboo, and he actually used it during his life because the end is worn down. Um, so yeah, virtual autopsy really believed a lot, re revealed a lot about King Tut. Um, and it can also be used in legal investigations. So we mentioned crimes uh, and murder. And so in a lot of countries, you can use, um, virtual autopsy along with standard autopsy. So there isn't really anywhere where it's widespread to use just virtual autopsy, but the technologies are pretty broadly used across the world. Um, and actually something that I found out by accident, I was just reading a random paper about virtual autopsies, is that in New Mexico, we have our own virtual autopsy center which was made with UNM and the New Mexico Office of Medical Examiners. And it's one of the first in the country that conducts virtual autopsies. And virtual autopsies can also be used in, um, oh, okay. 
Carly, I'm answering your question right now. Um, I just saw it in the chat. Um, so they're pretty widespread in conjunction with standard autopsies. So the, it isn't very common to have a place used just virtual autopsies, but it is common for a country um, to use standard autopsies and also x-rays and MRIs and CTs along with it. Um, and so you can also use virtual autopsies for human rights investigations. So there's this group, the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team. Their acronym is EAAF in Spanish. Definitely recommend their website. Um, it is in Spanish, but Google Translate for Spanish has gotten super good, like really good. So um, you can, it's pretty legible um, to for English speakers also, so I recommend it. Um, and so they use x-rays um, in conjunction with standard autopsy procedures to do their investigations. Um, and this team began in Argentina because there was a dictatorship that had um, would kidnap people and those people would go missing and they needed to identify bodies that had been exhumed and to return them to their families to offer closure. And so from there, from Argentina, they've become a very like internationally respected group that goes across the world to conduct autopsies. And the technology in virtual autopsies, so CTs, MRIs, x-rays, is also something that's encouraged by the Minnesota, um, let me move my bar, the Minnesota protocol. Um, and that's part of, um, the Minnesota protocol is this piece of like documentation from the UN um, Human Rights Commission that basically outlines how you can do an autopsy on someone who has been um, killed because of, you know, government um, oppression and stuff like that. Um, and so that's something that's also used in human human's rights investigations. Um, it's like the rule book, pretty much. So in conclusion, virtual autopsy is very common in archaeology and has emergent and like it has somewhat commonality in um, legal investigations, just in conjunction with the standard autopsies. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question, Carly. Um, and then. Yeah, go ahead, Carly. You're going to say something. Yes, it does. Yeah, it just, I never heard too much about virtual autopsy, so it's interesting to hear yeah. about. Cool. Okay. So that's all I have. Uh, I did, I, I did, I went over and I'm super sorry if I, you know, <laughs> I thought it was going to happen. I, I did think. I was like, uh oh, I'm in danger of doing it. And then it did. So, um, this, if you, everyone has any more questions about anything we covered, anything at all, now's the time. And I also, I know Zen, you had a question and I probably should have answered it because uh, your, your question about LIDAR, um, because I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> I probably should have just said so, but I was like, oh, I'll just tell him I don't know in the Q&A. So, um, so Olivia, why don't you stop sharing so that way we can see your your yeah. beautiful mug? Yes. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> well, so thank you all. Thank you so much, um, Olivia, for this incredibly rich talk. Um, who has questions? What would you, what do you all want to know? Come on, folks. I'm um, not I'm done talking yet. Uh, where did you do all your research for this? Okay, well, um, I can give you a bibliography if you want to look at the stuff, but really, um, a lot of stuff you just have to, I had to monitor the news for a while. Um, so there are a couple, um, so for example, for archaeology news, there's um, a couple like, I think, Sci News and stuff like that, they will have like, they'll just They'll give you short updates, like headlines of stuff that's been discovered. So that's how I found out about a lot of LIDAR stuff is they'd be like, oh, look at this LIDAR thing that just happened, that just got published. And I'd be like, wow, yeah, I will look at that. And then I would go look it up, maybe find some more in-depth articles, uh, get my grubby hands on a paper if it was not behind a paywall, um, stuff like that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think. A lot of it is I just need an a like one article or a headline to just give me my topic and then you can google more specifically and then refine from there um you guys also both know that i do use wikipedia for their resource section because 
like they have excellent bibliographies. And so you can go through there and find if, I didn't use it so much, I didn't use it for this presentation, I don't think, but as a general rule of thumb, look out for those Wikipedia bibliographies. Those are good. Not necessarily the text because those are user submitted, but the bibliographies, good place to start. So yeah, it's just really like a hopscotching thing. I just need a headline and then from there I can kind of get to it. It, it, it. it took a while though, like I'm not gonna lie. If anyone has any tips, <laughs> that was, it was a long, it was a long process. Okay, thank you. Right. Anyone else? I know there's got to be. Okay, Javier. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, a uh, quick fun thing just before a small question. But just thinking of the, the New York uh, Metropolitan Museum, uh, I have another weird example of it's not something that was looted, but someone donated a just three completely fake artifacts over there that just stayed in the museum for almost 30 years. Wow, geez. So, rather than just being Cambodian art, it was uh, just fake Greek Etruscan art. Yeah, so, um, it's. I think it's a problem. I mean, I don't think it's a problem to display replicas, but when it's fake and you're like, this is real, that's like, that's, hmm, that's, not, that's not good practice, that's lying. Okay, so what's your what's your what's your question, Javier? So yeah, the thing that when did they start using this stuff, virtual autopsies on just mummified remains? That's honestly really cool. They were able to do that for King Tut. Um, I think so. I think around the early two thousands, there was a mummy who I don't remember that mummy's name. I'm so sorry, mummy. That around 2002, um, I believe, when the virtual autopsies were just being developed, they sent that money over to Switzerland and had it virtual autopsies. It's been used for money for quite a while. Um, yeah. Just a moment. There's Looks like the this earbud's getting a little off. <laughs> okay, so yeah, the answer is pretty much. All right, so thank you for asking the question. Well, answering the question, I appreciate it. Thank you for asking how we are. Absolutely um, welcome. Okay, so before I forget, then you brought up CFCT. Um, and that inspires, like, this is like a huge topic of Russian insight. And it's super complicated, which is why I didn't get into it. But you're right um, in that. To, because Ukraine was under the power of the Soviet Union for a very long time, Russian was something we just had to know. There, is, there was no way to advance in Soviet society in any way or any capacity without knowing Russian. Like there was just no way. Um, so what happened is we were kind of forced into bilingualism. So, you know, for me, I learned Spanish, but that was kind of a privilege because I got to go to a school that taught me that when I was young. And so, but in this case, it was like, you needed to be bilingual to advance in society. If you wanted to know your native language, the language of your culture and succeed, you had to be bilingual. Um, and so some people, um, that's why in Ukraine, there are some places that just own, like pretty much everyone just speaks Russian. And that's not because everyone there is Russian, although there are definitely Russian people in Ukraine. Um, you know, don't wanna leave them out because they do exist. Um, and they do live in Ukraine. But sometimes in these areas, particularly in the South and the East, those places became heavily industrialized during the Soviet Union. Um, and because they were so industrialized, that means that like you needed to know Russian to work. Um, so here's an example. So my grandfather is from Donetsk, which is in the East. And he was Ukrainian, his family, with the Ukrainian speaking family in his childhood. And he had two siblings. Um, and all three of those people, my grandfather included, had different relationships with Ukrainian later in their life. So he um, spoke Ukrainian with my mom and his wife, my grandma, um, you know, like in the home. So, um, you know, like pretty much as good of a relationship with Ukraine you could have during the Soviet Union. Um, 
but his sister who moved to another town in Donetsk that was I, I mean just you had to speak Russian there um maybe it had a large Russian population maybe it was just um a lot of the times in the east like entire towns would exist because a factory existed there that was the case in eastern Ukraine and also that was the case of Pripyat which is where Chernobyl was like that town only existed because of that power plant so in those towns Russian speaking is super common and in her personal life she spoke Russian to her children um because that was the environment she was in and that's you know um and for me actually like when I was a kid um I spoke Russian because the mentality is like how like for me like how would I get more opportunities knowing Ukrainian where it's spoken in one country like half the time although that's changing lots of people and you can't speak Ukrainian now or learning Russian from a young age to um have access to Russia and all of these post-Soviet countries um I ended up learning neither so <laughs> you know but you know that's the that's I guess is an important thing to talk about is like that's why Russian is so common is because it, with it comes opportunity um yeah so um i did yeah like it's weird because in the headlines i feel like they'll, they'll put like russian part of ukraine doesn't want russian invaders and it's like no that's a russian speaking region that um because there are places with lots of russians in them but there aren't that many with like russian majority there are definitely cities and towns with russian majority but there's nowhere where like it's just russians right so it's russian speaking and i think in america we're super used to like okay you speak spanish so you're from central america you speak english so you're from this place you speak french so you're from france but in the soviet union that was not like that the relationship between language and like your identity like your ethnic identity was much more complicated so yeah i think that's like something i want to point out super super complicated <laughs> yeah For sure. i know um the person who's now moving to uh ukraine he was he was born there and lived there till he was 10 oh, but wow. he, yeah but he was he learned uh of course to speak russian yeah and then he, he moved with his parents to the u.s and i think he lived in baltimore he lived in baltimore up until recently that has a lot those are a lot of there's a lot of ukrainians in washington like so many oh i mean in what maryland but around washington dc um like i was like what there's a huge i i yeah, would a, love for you to tell him about me if he's interested because i had i have literally met no ukrainian americans i don't know how it happened yeah, i've well, literally met them <laughs> so i think He's coming because he's my aunt's uh, boyfriend. So he's he's coming back this August uh, later on. So maybe if he's in town, I'll say, hey, there's this really cool person who likes anthropology, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, he sounds like a cool person. Yeah. Also, <laughs> uh, the other Ukrainian person I know, I don't remember her name, but she's involved with which what used to be a Trick Lock Theater Company. And oh, so. Wow uh she's super cool uh again i know her through my aunt and uh yeah she does theater stuff cool yeah i i think the closest i've ever gotten i think is like just we have a, a weak soviet diaspora in albuquerque it's so disappointing it's so sad i've met a couple russian people here and there some of them have moved away and i've met one of my friends is from Turkmenistan. And that's the closest I've gotten is <laughs> like, is, and so, yeah. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Come on, guys. You gotta, you gotta ask me some. I have somewhat of a question. Go ahead. Uh, and forgive me if you've already answered this as I missed a portion of the talk. Oh, you're uh, okay. But with some of these statues that had their, uh, that were detached from the hands and feet, uh, if were, were some of the hands and feet found, are they commonly uh, reattached to the statues or are they commonly found whatsoever or are they oftentimes more so just lost? Um, I don't know about arms. I think that's something that might just be lost unless it's, unless it's physically attached to something. But with feet and legs, um, when it's, they'll often be still attached to the pedestal where that statue was. 
And those pedestals um, are on display. Um, if they're really important statues that are really missed, they'll be on display in museums. So a statue feet will be on display, and that's all. You know, which is like super grim that like that's our world where museums will refuse to and private collectors will refuse to give back statues. So yeah, um, very common, I think, to have the feet and the legs. Not very common, I think, for arms. Um, so I, I don't know what it is with arms. I can't, I haven't seen anything about arms. That's definitely something to look into though, because that's the, I do, why are all these arms? You know, but um, yeah. Okay, I'm finished your question. It's a good one. Yeah, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, I hate to say it, but I think we should wrap up this conversation. Um, if you have any qu more questions for Olivia, please feel free to shoot her an email. Yeah, please email yeah. me. You gotta, <laughs> you got to. Yeah, Again, thank you for coming. Olivia, thank you so much for a very rich, interesting talk. Good job. And yes. ladies and gentlemen, Sorry thanks for, for coming. <laughs> yeah. And I'll thank see you as many coming. of you as possible tomorrow. Ooh. Everyone have Ooh. a good week. Thank you for coming. But actually, Hi. I'm so happy Thank you for the Bye. 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 B